Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Hi, it's Jonathan Goldhill, and welcome back to another episode of the Disruptive Successor Show. My guest today is another coach to trade contractors who is helping them to build greatness in their lives and businesses. Les O'Hara is a battle-tested serial entrepreneur with a solid three decades in the construction, real estate, sports training, and most recently, the coaching business for elite trade contractors. He and his wife of 32 years, Julie, have raised four sons who are now helping in their mission to make an impact on business owners across the U.S. using a unique playbook that was developed in running his trade companies. The foundational coaching of his playbook focuses on personal mastery and time management, strong financial education, and focus on cash flow and gross profits. Sales and marketing automation using a custom built CRM for owners and all the key systems and processes needed to run a successful business. If you're ready to confront challenges, strengthen accountability, and work toward financial success, Les has a personalized strategy to lead you there. Prepare for a journey filled with valuable insights and authentic experiences as Les O'Hara unfolds the playbook of his accomplished career. Les, welcome to the show today. Jonathan, quite an honor to be here. Great always to talk with you. Okay, great. Well, I'm showing myself to you now. I didn't have it before. The camera was just focused on you. Here we are together. We do very similar work. So this should be a really interesting conversation. You are strictly focused on the contractors. And unlike, you know, different from me, you're currently running your own businesses. So let's get, you know, I know you're in a masonry business. I believe you've been in roofing businesses as well. So why don't you just give the audience a little bit of your background and how you got to where you are today? Blessed that I was able to work with my father. He was a police lieutenant in Chicago, always had a little roofing company. And when he retired, did it full time. It was right when my insurance, my life insurance career failed. And we had our first child and I needed a job real quick. So I had to ask him for a job. And came on board and learned the roofing business. And my combination of what I had learned at the time versus my dad's old school really merged into something great. And we just built a really fun and fast growing company in those early years. That was the good news. The bad news is neither me or my dad knew anything on how to run a business or financials. And then we had a lot of rocky, rocky roads from there on. But yeah, quite a, quite a, quite a career jumping in your first business as a roughing business. Yeah. So, and I I just decided to project the back screen of my book, Disruptive Successor, because you were a guy who's coming in to the family business, knowing that you've got to maintain the core values and principles. Maybe those weren't even discovered at that time, meaning they weren't something that probably you and I talk about with our clients today, which is what what are the core values? What are the things you're willing to hire and fire people based on? It was intuitively maybe known and your dad applied those, but you had to change a lot of things in that business to make it really 
successful and so that it could support a larger, uh, a larger foundation or framework or m- more employees, I'm sure. Yeah. And I, I've been thinking about this, you know, what are those two or three things that I brought to the table that, you know, vaulted us from doing about a half a million to six million in under five years? And when I look back on it, it was really three main areas. One is we weren't, he was keeping track of his books in a notebook. So he knew what people were owing him versus what was paid out. Everything was being paid out in cash. And so I, Probably, you know, what, 35 years ago, QuickBooks was probably just starting out. It was desktop. It was very clunky. Yeah. But I got in my QuickBooks and we just started doing everything manually so we could make some great decisions. Getting everything on QuickBooks was a game changer because now we were making smarter decisions. That was number one. Number two, my dad, like most contractors that get in the trades, they're not marketing or advertising savvy. They are great with people and they know how to do the work. So my dad was one of those typical, you had the clip art of a guy hammering on top of a roof. That was your logo. That was your business card. And so what I did was I just took our branding. I One of the things I attribute to a lot of my successes, we looked like a million bucks before we were even doing a million bucks. And so we sold the part that we had our act together. We know what we were doing before we ever did. That led us to closing more jobs. And so that was the branding and messaging component. And then lastly, the third part that I brought in from my failed insurance career was all the insurance companies were using CRMs to keep track of their opportunities, sales opportunities. This was unknown in the trades. So we built a CRM that was going to track every job, every proposal that was out on the street, every big customer that could give us repeat business. And then we would start working that database. And that's what led to just a whole more growth than what our competitors were doing. Yeah. So let's parse each one of those from the top. The first one being financial, understanding, education, sophistication. The second one being marketing making it look like a more sophisticated company. The third one being using automation and a, a, um, a CRM, which is a customer or a contact relationship management type of software. And, and we'll get into more. So the first thing is you and I have probably run across a lot of companies who might be doing $600,000 like you or like your father was doing. They might be doing even up to $2 million before they really know their finances. And when I say really know their finances, I mean, some of them just know how to read a profit and loss statement. They don't really understand that a balance sheet is the value of their enterprise over time. And they don't understand the distinction between a construction company that's doing install work and a maintenance company that is building an, like an asset base with recurring revenue. So they don't necessarily understand the value of those things, but they don't really pay attention to anything but maybe the top and the bottom line. And you and I both know that they can probably get rid of the top line, just look at their gross profit margin, because that's where they have to manage from there. But so those are two main things you need to manage is, do they have the right gross profit margin? How do we even measure that? And that gets into some sophistication of accounting of, you know, job costing, time, materials, all that kind of stuff. So let's just talk about maybe some of our experiences with some of these smaller companies. And it seems like they're struggling to get the financial information because they're so busy just doing the work that they don't have good financial talent. And I think one of the first things I do is focus on, let's get some good financial talent so we really know how much money we're making. And then we can set some targets or goals. If you're making 2% or 5% net income, let's target a 10 or 12 or 15%. And let's see how we're going to get there step by step. So what are some of the things that, that you've experienced, discovered, shared with your clients, the good, bad, the ugly? Well, first off, I love how you say financial talent, because that's what's usually lacking in these businesses is one, 
maybe someone internally, you know, knowing exactly where to put the things and how to code things and put it towards jobs. But really, it's the external advice. That talent is really lacking. Let me give you two really good examples in the last 24 hours that I see almost on a weekly basis. So I was working with a gutter company just this morning, doing about a half a million dollars a year. And so I'm working with them to see how can we be of help? What's going on with the business? So when I dig into QuickBooks, what I'm realizing is garbage in is garbage out. So I'm trying to analyze this business and give the owner some wisdom. But the way that the bookkeeping was done, we couldn't even get to that step. So they had negative accounts receivable, undeposited funds where no one was attributing them, payroll liabilities were false. So I had to table the conversation and I, we have to find that financial talent. Luckily, I have a great coach, Ariel, who does that for our clients. She's got to dig in and, and, and start cleaning that all up. So now that for, for the small owner up to 2 million, they need to get all of the accounts dialed in so that when we run a report, it's actual the real numbers, the gross profit, the percent of income of marketing spend to, to revenue, to the take-home pay for the owner, to the insurance spend. That's priority number one. But the second that I encounter almost equally is now that, that owners that, that's got past that million dollar mark, they're at two to three million dollars and they're growing. They've got leads coming in. But what they're not doing is they're not forecasting their cash. So now they are robbing Peter to pay Paul. You know, it, it, they're doing more jobs, but the cash isn't there because now that collection system and the timing of AR and when you have to pay the materials and subs is off compared to what the cash is. So they have no way of forecasting their cash. And that is the other problem that we, we try to solve for them is, is help them build that forecast. Yeah. And so this is cooking, but not with a recipe per se, but knowing how to make, come out with a good proper dish. And I, I, I use the analogy of cooking without a recipe and a proper dish because specifically at that point in time, it's now important to put in processes around collection, billing, invoicing. You're now also putting in some financial talent. And this doesn't happen overnight. You don't get the results next week or probably even a month from now. It, took, it could take three months or longer. I've seen some companies take a much longer time because one, they can't find or don't trust the financial talent that's put before them, or they're right. just not ready to hire. They just feel like, geez, I can't hire. Yeah, I can't afford to hire someone to do this because I'm just trying to keep the doors open still. And so it's a bit of a messy process in that sense. You know, we can put, okay, let's talk about some collection practices and procedures and we can put some better financials together over time, but like this takes time. And so I find that what you and I might be working on is we might say, okay, we need to switch gears here, Les. We, we, let's, let's attack now some of the marketing stuff. Like your website is really bad. You don't have a Google presence. You don't have reviews. You don't have a proper identity, branding, differentiating me marketing message. So let's start working on some of those things. And so, you know, it's literally like we're making a casserole over here. And suddenly we say, like, we got to get a salad going because we, the, the, you know, we got to feed these people. They're hungry. We got to give them something. So it's a little bit of a juggling act and it starts to come together as a meal later on, but it, yeah. you know, it's more like a buffet. We keep putting, bringing stuff out that's better and better over time. That's, that's that my idea. analogy. Yeah, I love that analogy now. I never thought of it that way, but it is truly, you, you, you don't, they're not, but this is a buffet. It's not going to come to you. First, you work on the salad, then the soup, then the main course, then the right. dessert. Right. You're getting every, you have to eat a little bit of everything at the same time. Otherwise, yeah. You're, you're back to square one. Yeah. And so let's talk about a few more of these difficult things to put in place. So like, for instance, a CRM, not an easy thing, you know, like any software that you begin with, 
a software that's especially one that's custom built, like you know how to run it. To you, it's easy because you've been using it, you've been working with it with other clients, but to someone else, a new client who, or a client who's just getting it for the first time, they're having to get used to it and learn that that's a learning curve. That's time away from being in the trenches. And so if they're a technician who's out, you know, doing the gutter work, doing the masonry, doing the roofing, they're not going to learn the stuff they need to learn that helps them work on the business, which is where we're trying to, to take them. And so whether it's a job costing software or a CRM software or gaining the financial education or, or documenting processes, these are all things that take a lot of time. Yeah. People need to be patient, right? Yeah. Well, what we've tried to do is, and I so appreciate that because I've been in that shoe where you're the main owner and you have to take care of all those things. So I'm always looking for either the people or the processes that can eliminate myself out of that role. And so thus, as I've been coaching contractors for the last eight years, what I realized is that there really wasn't anything on the market to really automate some of those key systems that all of us need as a business owner. So the CRM, yes, you need a champion in your company or you as the owner need to learn it. But once you install some of the automations, it now does it all for you. So you talk about a leverage and a return on your time and investment. If you learn how we could de design an email sequence to go out when someone requests an estimate on your website or calls in, and we could automatically send out emails and SMSs to them to lock them into an appointment for you to go out and look at their project, we have now saved someone time calling, texting, emailing. That, that is a time savings. Now you go out and you do the estimate and you send it to the customer. Well, who's going to follow up on it? Well, now you just move it into the pipeline to the estimate was sent. And now it's going to send out an SMS in two or three days. How did our bid look? How can we earn your business? Here's some more testimonials of other people in your area that we've done work for. So the CRM seems daunting, but as we've seen it, when the owner gets it and it clicks, they realize this is the best. I could now build something once and it, it it's going to repeat itself. It's that, it's that true role. Well, three. Yep. So, you know, a lot of people today are talking about AI, artificial intelligence, and the impact that it could have or will have on our businesses and our jobs and our people. But <laughs> automation is the precursor, if you will, to AI and automation will replace manual processes of sending out emails and texts and doing follow-up like that. So super important. And I just want to go back. I, as, I, as I think of the work that I've been doing with clients over the years, over the decades, the inflection points that really move the needle on their profitability and their revenues, first is the financial talent. Getting some good, decent, financial, good financial talent that helps them to understand their gross profit margins and how they can improve it. I think another inflection point or game changer, if you will, for clients is when they put a really good estimating and job costing program in place. Now they can really fine tune those margin numbers and they can really build, you know, some cash reserves from that. So do you find that a CRM is like another game changer kind of inflection point for cost, for your cost customers? Yes, in a couple of, couple of ways. One is that we just talked about was the time savings. But two, CRMs nowadays, especially ours, the Build 12 CRM, has AI built into it. So for example, that owner, he can go in there and have AI build him social media posts that will be pre-populated pre with whatever category. If he says bathroom remodel, give, give me, you know, the seven things you need to know about bathroom remodel. AI is going to give that with an image and then it's going to post it for him whenever he says it for. So 
really, that's a game changer. That is a game changer. Yeah. And, but the third main one is the fortune is in the follow-up. And you know that better than anyone, Jonathan. So how can they follow up? How can they stay in touch? How can they be top of mind when someone needs your services? It's to make sure that you're staying in front of your contacts. So how do you do that? You automate it. You, you make a newsletter once a month with some tips or tricks, or you have a special offer to keep the guys busy. Then you can just blast it out to your whole database. And so we, we show it, you know, I have a masonry company and I do it live for my students is I'll go in there, I'll pick 20 property managers and I'll blast out an SMS. Hey, it's Les from North Shore Brickwork. I got guys sitting on their hands. What, you have anything for us to look at masonry wise? And then literally within 15 minutes, hey, here's this address. Go over there, take a look at it. Next one shows up. Nothing right now. Check back with me in a month. But it's just that simple blocking and tackling that if you do it, you're going to get more business. That's great. Let's talk about your sons. I know one of your sons is involved in the software business. He's based out here near me in Los Angeles. Yeah. What kind of a role are your sons playing in the, in the business ventures that you have? And, and how are they changing the status quo and, and, and challenging you to be even greater than you are? Well, it's that younger generation that brings different ways of looking at it. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So the boys, they're, are, they're really men now. They're all over, you know, 21 or over. But they're, they're getting to see entrepreneurship uh, up close and personal and what it, what it really entails. And what it really entails is nothing happens until someone sells something. Right. So, you know, to start some of these entities from scratch, they're seeing how competitive and how hard it is to really get momentum. And that's really for any business owner. When they start out, it is about selling. It is about communicating a message and having something to offer to the marketplace. So they're getting that firsthand experience. But now they're actually diving in and having to learn how to sell. What is our unique offering to a client? And how are we going to position that and offer it so that we can close, close that deal? Total game changer for them. They're now in, in, in selling mode. Before they just thought, you know, I ran these businesses and things just came in, you know, like no one's doing anything. Right. There's salesmanship. But it's been an honor. My oldest son, Zach, he's down in Florida. He's a third generation now roofing contractor. He sells roofs for a very successful company down there. He's top salesman there probably because he knows how to use his grandfather and his father was in the roofing business. So he uses that as in a great way. Good for him. Now, my other three sons are all helping out in some form or fashion to help us build a really nice coaching business that could impact contractors all across the country. That's great. So tell me and tell us rather about Build 12. That's the CRM. Tell us a little bit about the backstory, like what got you started on it? How far along are you in the development of it? Yeah. User install base. So tell us, and you know, some of the functionality, talk, tell us about it. Thanks. So Build 12 is a custom built CRM that Devin and I founded just going on about a year ago. But the framework was what I, what I love showing my other contacts and, and contractors is I am exposed to the best of the best tricks of the trade, SEO vendors, pay-per-click, CRMs, insurance agents. And so many years ago, one of my best clients had the, the software and showed it to me and said, would you be interested in looking at this? I loved it because you, you know, I'm a CRM junkie. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using pipeline and I was using act and I'm using Salesforce. So really dug into it and found out that this could all be customized for the construction space. So now we have, we have close to 40 paid users on the platform. That they're getting handheld like no one's business. We have two zoom calls every week. They're able to jump on and get exposed to how you do some of these basic building blocks. But here's the cool thing that this could do for you. It's truly a Swiss army knife. We like calling it if we're going to stay on brand. 
It does your social media posts. It keeps track of all your contacts and sales opportunities. It builds it in pipelines so you can know at any time how many hundreds of thousands of dollars of work you have in whatever stage. You could build your website on there. You could build funnel pages, landing pages, email newsletters, um, uh, your review management, which is so important nowadays. You connect your Google My Business page right to it. You mark a customer as completed job. It will do the review process for you. It'll send out an email, SMS, and it'll keep going until you get that review. It'll even reply to every review, AI reply. It'll take their name, what you did for them, and it'll reply so you don't have to. So it's just fun to build these systems because once an owner builds that automation, it's there forever for them. They never have to mess with it other than maybe changing it up and, and keeping it refreshed. I think it's great. And are you saying when you say it's custom built, meaning that each client or customer gets a custom customization that's, I mean, is this the airplane that you're, you're building as you're flying it kind of a situation? So that's, yeah. where, that's where we come in. So we know what a service trade contractor needs and we have all of the templates. Mm -hmm. If they could just open it up, we have, we have a web, web website templates they, that they would love. If they didn't have a website, in, in literally two days, they have a website up and running with a form and a chat widget and everything right. they need for their company. But the email templates and the automations of what happens when someone mm -hmm. calls in and no one answers the phone, we have an automation that'll automatically text that person back. Right. Hey, you know, so we've taken care of all those and then we plug them in based on what they need. It sounds great. I mean, I use HubSpot, but not that aggressively. It sounds like it's very similar to what HubSpot has, which is built on its platform. May, may I share your, what your platform is built on? On high level? Right. And so, you know, it's always important, I would imagine, as an entrepreneur, you know, you're looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm dependent upon this single supplier who's my vendor. Like, they have to be strong because if they yeah. go down, then your software is, goes down with it, I suppose. But the concept is, the, is what's so important. Once someone understands the importance of having this in their business, then they can take this to another business and make it implement it much faster. And I tell this as a story because a client of mine many years ago came to me, he was doing $2 million in the window film installation business. And he had this business for 20 years and it was almost on autopilot. And he kind of was, he was the largest window film installer in the LA or Southland region, let's say. And these weren't cars. These were buildings, commercial buildings, high-end residential properties. Sure. And anyway, he had a love for another business that he was trying to get off the ground. And it was a mountain bike manufacturing business, completely different industry, niche, everything. But it followed his passion. And I said to him, Chris, you will be able to get that mountain bike manufacturing business up to this, the level that this current business is at $2 million so fast because everything you know and learned in that business and the stuff I've been teaching you, like you'll be able to scale this to $5 million really quickly. And that's exactly what happened wow. because he knew the processes and the procedures. He knew what it meant to be a CEO and how to lead how to hire all the, you know, how to, how to get good financial talent, all those things. And so it's so important to have a good CRM and whether you're, you know, whether you're on go high level or you're moving it to another platform, it's great. But I love that you have custom built this for people. And yeah. just a the, the, just to piggyback on that. So, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Yes. And every one of these, the CRM, I use it for our short-term rental business. I use it for the coaching business. I use it for the masonry business. Right. Exactly to my point. So yeah, you, you, you've learned how to just, good. yep, exactly. Because it's a Swiss army knife and you know how to use that same knife blade, whether you're cutting a fish open or, or chiseling wood or something like that. Same, same principles apply across any industry. Yep. All right. I want to talk about 
what I consider to be my silver bullet tool, and I bet yours as well, because it's a game changer for entrepreneurs or small business owners. It's the first thing in your foundational coaching in your playbook, and that's mastery over your personal and t- priorities and time management. And this is about this, this tool for me, I've referred to it as the vital few, trivial many. It's been referred to as uh, delegate and elevate. It's been uh, love and loathe. You know, this is about finding out and figuring out where you're, you know, how to operate out of your zone of genius, your zone of excellence and delegating yourself, delegating things that are not your top priorities to other people, whether it's outside your company. But I find that if we're going to leverage ourselves as leaders, this is also a game changer. It allowed to, allows us to replicate, duplicate ourselves and scale the business. Do you, don't you agree, Les? Biggest game changer that any CEO, president, owner of their business can do almost immediately to have a big return on that investment of time. So my analogy is when I went to play college football for the first time and we got into the practices, not only was all of the meetings before practice very structured in time and agenda, and every day you as the player knew what time you had meetings, what time you had to get dressed and have treatment and all that. But then when we got to the practice field, which we'll call the owner's game day, right? It's like now it's eight to five. Every one of those hours spent on the practice field was broken out in five minute increments that was on a plan that you knew at the beginning, let's say the first five minutes was stretching. The second five minutes is a little bit of jogging. Then it goes into individual backpedaling and this specific. And then we bring everyone to the group and then we have scrimmage and all the way down to the end of practice. So when I got into the real world and I started coaching those four boys in football, one of the first things I did was I would bring the same structured practice plan that I knew in college and I would run our practices very precise and we would be doing great. And then you know what happened? I had an incredible coaching career because we focused in on the most important things that I knew as a coach we needed to do. A lot of it was blocking and tackling. So now as I reach and work with one-on-one with these owners, I look at their calendar and they don't have their time blocked out at all. So that top priority, that one thing that we need to work on is never getting worked on. So I am really a fanatic of having them build me out their ideal week. And let me see where you're spending that time. And let me watch your game film. That's what I tell them. Let me see your last week game film. And then I'll tell you where we have to delegate, where you have to put more time in, and where you have to totally delete this time out of your, your schedule. 100% 100% agree. Having an ideal default calendar where your top priorities for that day are put, you know, front loaded, where your calendar is, is two thirds uh, booked out, whether those are time or appointments with yourself, with your staff, with your customers, with your prospects, however you think that your time is best spent, like block out two thirds of the day. And leave a third for, you know, slop or for, you know, crises or whatever to deal with. But like that old method, we call it the Ivy Lee method. You're probably familiar with like make your priorities and then prioritize those top five priorities and make those your first thing you do the next day before you get into your email, before you, you know, get lost in, you know, other stuff. Like, what are the things that are most important for you to do and have that calendar and build that discipline of focusing on your top priorities, your top projects, your top people. So important and a game changer. And yeah, time management isn't just time management. It's about priority management. So yeah, you and I I both experienced that. What I'm learning, Jonathan, just as a add on to that, it's really energy management too. Yes. I'm, I'm big into biohacking and helping these owners you know, be in the best shape of their life and sleeping good 
and, you know, really sucking the juice out of life. And what they have to realize is that if they wait and do those top priorities to somewhere where they think they're going to do it and it's not in their energy zone where they have focus and energy, yep. it's going to be short circuited. So it's really identification for that individual. When is that power, you know, 90 minutes going to happen? You're taking a chapter right out of my book, which is in the people discipline of the seven P's framework, where I talk about energy management. And I, I think I give a, I started off with like a, a physics equation and then break that physics equation down because it's really about managing your energy when it's at its peak, which is usually in the morning for most people. And rather than getting lost in the, you know, in the, the daily grind before and before you look up and then say, geez, I didn't get anything done today. Worst so, feeling in the world. Worst feeling in the world when your day just got away from you and you didn't get the things that you wanted to get done. Exactly. So, you know, along those lines, you and I both really strongly believe in the value of having an executive or personal assistant, whether it's a maybe a, a chief of staff or maybe it's your a virtual ad administrative assistant, someone that you can offload small activity work to that isn't your highest and best use of your time. And, it, and to quote Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach, who said, you know, if someone can do something 80% as well as you or as reasonably well as you, like delegate it to them and don't manage how they do it, just manage towards the outcome. I'm with you. Way, way that really could crystallize it for an owner is, if they want to make $250,000 in a year take home and you divide that by 2080, that's $120 an hour is what you're worth for that owner. So anytime you can delegate any task for under that 120, you're making money on it. Exactly. And you could be focusing on, 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 on the gems that's really right. going to have the business. Right. And, and this is difficult work to implement you know, put into practice, but like I kind of make, try and make it concrete. If you're doing $40 an hour work, you are either stealing $80 an hour from the company or you're putting in extra time to make up so you can get to that other work that needs to get done or you're not getting it done at all and you're getting stuck in, you know, in, in one activity or another. So buy back your time, find people who can do stuff Find enough 40, 20, 30, $60 an hour work, make it into a single job that makes sense, find the right talent, and then, you know, focus on what you're best at. And if I could throw a little plug in here, it's that's exactly what we've done is so each of my businesses is run by a chief of staff and they don't even work in the states that my businesses are in. My chief of staff lives in Idaho. And she's running the masonry company in Illinois and Chicago, Wisconsin. My chief of staff for Build 12 is in Ohio. My chief of staff for the short-term rental businesses, she's in Oklahoma. So what we realized when I'm working with contractors is that talent is lacking in their business. They have all these things that they need to do, but they can't get to them. So we developed a company called QBVA that we take these Moms that were in the business world or they were teachers and they have some skill sets in that talent, right? The talent in either QuickBooks, social media, business development. And then we take them and they, they all, they want about 20 to 25 hours a week. That's all they can do. And so we hand select them and we're matchmakers for your business. Put them in there, teach them the system already, teach them the, the CRM, teach them QuickBooks, teach them your system. And then you can now start delegating to that person. Les, I, I love it. I, I was going to say you're on fire, but that might be a wrong metaphor for a contractor. But so you got QBVA, <laughs> you got Build 12, Contractor Huddle. How do people get a hold of you? They want to learn more besides by following the link in the show notes. I like for people to connect with me on LinkedIn and just say, hey, saw you on Jonathan's podcast. That'd be really cool. I, I like to... Build that network out. You know how important LinkedIn is nowadays. Yes. It's the business owners. That's a great way. 
on lessohero.com. Another good way. See all that I got my hands into and then we'll connect from there. Great. So it's less O with an apostrophe, Hara. And then I assume there's no apostrophe in the, in the URL. It's just less O-H-A-R-A.com. That's it. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Great having you on the show, folks. I hope you got some value from this. You're, you're talking to two people who think a lot alike, have worked with many of the same types of clients and have an experience share that is so similar or on opposite ends of the country. It's something similar about us and it's something similar about you. And I hope you got some value from it. So, you know, the drill, if you got some value from the show, please like it, share it with others and contact me or my guest for further assistance in your business. Thanks so much for listening to the Disruptive Successor Show. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to DisruptiveSuccessor.com.